I'd be unwell. Is that a melody from somebody else, or did I make that up? I'd be unwell. Oh. It's okay. For uh, me. Hey, don't don't think about it. Just. I know. The thought is emotionally draining. I know. But I know it's worth it. But like the thought is emotionally draining. Hey, I'm Adrian. And I'm Israel. And we are about to take you on a journey that we'd like to call Faith and Familia because it has truly taken some faith to start our family. Start our familia. Oh, you bilingual now, Ooh. okay. I felt like for the last almost six years, the journey to us family planning has not gone at all the way I thought it would at all. No. And while I've mentioned it a few times here and there and thrown it in there and obviously made it very clear that my dream is to become a mother, I've never really gone in depth um, of what my experience has been. I figured now is the time to encourage someone, make someone not feel so alone and mm. bring hope and information at the same time. I think that, you know, bringing awareness to the fact that so many of us are going through this is really important. So here I am opening myself up to this. At first, I feel like I've dodged having this conversation because just to be honest, I thought it was gonna be an emotional roller coaster for me. I, I thought I couldn't have the conversation. I've watched so many other people be vulnerable and transparent about what they've gone through. And I've always admired that because we've watched documentaries and yeah. and literally been like, how, how do they find the strength? Get the worst news of their life with their own camera I don't documenting know. it and Couldn't crying it. and sobbing. And then how do they put that out? Like, I know that that's not really easy for you and I to do. It hasn't been, and that's yeah. probably why I haven't done it. And I think I needed to encourage myself before I could encourage anyone else. Wow. I had to ha find hope for myself before I could attempt to, it, it's like they say in the airplane, put your mask on and get yourself some oxygen before you hand it to somebody else. And I feel like I'm at that place now and I'm ready to take you guys along with me on this journey. I think that had I done this even a year ago, I would look like someone who is having a nervous breakdown and not like, and I don't think people understand that you can create this wall and this appearance and this smile and this image that like, yeah, everything's okay. And I've got to be honest, I think naturally that's who I am. You always say that you're like, I don't know how you just, yeah. I go do my job and live my life and, and genuinely still be happy while going through something really, really difficult. I think that speaks to you being a professional. Like you just, you understand that work is work Thank and you. like private stuff is private stuff. Yeah. But fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, a lot of our private life also does spill out into public awareness, public yeah. Uh, interest. Yeah, I feel like being on the reel yeah. for almost nine years, I have been so transparent about so many things that I think in so many areas of my life, most would say she's an open book. Like I'm almost too honest for my own good. And with this, it was just different. Mm. And if I'm being honest, it was too sacred to share with everyone. I didn't want to share it because I also didn't want your opinion. And that's really honest. I didn't want you to tell me how you felt about something that was really hard for me to even understand. Mm -hmm. I didn't wanna get advice, unsolicited advice of like, well, have you tried this? Well, have you tried this? Oh, trust me, I've tried it all. And trust me, we've had a lot of unsolicited advice. Yeah, and I think even when I didn't bring it to the forefront, there were people telling me how ignorant I was to believe and pray for a miracle when I should be seeking medical advice. And I'm like, you have no, no idea. idea what I've been through. It's okay to create boundaries and safe spaces 
in times and in moments like this. And if you are going through a fertility journey yourself that is not easy, it's okay for you to create a bubble for yourself. I wouldn't say isolate. I think it's important for you to have your tribe. For me, it was, you know, obviously Israel. We were in this together. Um, my mother, my sister, my best friend, Lana. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, my sister's mother-in-law, Mama Felician, who is like the ultimate prayer warrior. Mm -hmm. And there was something about her believing with me as well that really gave me the courage. And at the same time, knowing that this person was holding my prayer close to their heart. It, it wasn't for a conversation to be like, you know, you know, she's struggling in that area or, you know, they're, they've been trying, but you don't want those whispers. You want to be able to share your heart with people who are going to be genuinely praying for you, hopeful, wanting the best for you. And that's what I surrounded myself with during that time to get there. I'm grateful for you because in the hardest of times, sometimes you somehow some way you and I always find something to laugh about we're talking the hardest of times and then at the same time you also allow me to be sad you give me the right to be like pitiful helpless it's okay to not be it's okay. okay to not be okay yeah, yeah. the uh, expectations were so high and then to get just the you know kick in the side of the head of your life the kick in the soul, you know what I mean? And expecting that, okay, this is gonna ruin our whole week, this is gonna ruin our whole month, this is gonna, this is gonna last, this one's gonna hurt for a while. And it does hurt, it still hurts, but the elastic of this woman that just says, you know what, I, I could either stay sad and depressed and hurt and disappointed, or I can seize this next day. I have a fresh 24 hours on the clock. This is called faith and familia, so there's always a little bit of faith put in here. And we cling to the promise that God's mercy for us is new every single morning. That's what he promised. And so it would almost be a disservice to come into the next day and like go, I don't want any mercy. I, I, I know you're cooking mercy up and fresh down there, but I'm just going to walk right past the kitchen into the sadness of my day. As opposed to God going, I have something special for you today, too. It either is that I am <clears throat> hands down the most delusional human being on planet Earth or I'm the most hopeful. So it, it could go either way. There's something really special about finding the love of your life and wanting to create life with that person. Yeah. <laughs> I love a good baby name, <laughs> but I never yearned to create life with someone more than is. I think there was something, I, mean, I don't know, I feel like when you're really in love with somebody, or in my case, me being really in love with you, and you just having perfect dimples, <laughs> and just like, I was like, oh! So this was a DNA play. This was a DNA play on the level of, <laughs> I just wanted to have a little version of you that I could stare at forever, and a piece of you that was a piece of me, and that's real. Like, I don't think people talk enough about like, oh, well, why do you want to have a baby? I have always dreamt of loving someone the way my mother loves me. Mm. Like I've always dreamt of looking into a child's eyes the way my mom would look into my eyes with such wonder and such like awe of, oh my gosh, like you're a part of me. Today I was on the treadmill with you and I was like, this does not come naturally to me. And what did I say right after that? But I can dance, but I can't run. Do you remember and, you said that? And who's that? My That's mom. Your mom, yeah. So there's things like that that I've always thought about and I've always found so intriguing and so interesting. And you always have the conversation about nature versus nurture. And, mm. you know, I'm this way because naturally, genetically, my mom is this way and I'm by nature this way because she raised me this way or my dad, right. you know, taught me this. Maybe I have natural musical gifting, but I also had a dad who would sit down and teach me how to harmonize and that's nature. You know, we were like, okay, our lives are dynamic and kind of crazy. Yeah. And this is our work schedule. So what if 
we did an IVF cycle because we initially set out to want to have twins. Yeah. It was all very glamorous in the idea of it. And I don't think anyone talks about the fact that while IVF can seem like something that we see celebrities do mm -hmm. and they have twins and it's like they got to pick the sex of their baby and it can seem so glamorized. Let's really get into the truth of in vitro fertilization. The idea of IVF actually came from us wanting twins. That's right. And then ignorantly thinking that this was gonna be so easy. It was gonna be like, we can choose the timing of when I get pregnant, what sex of the baby I get pregnant with, and everyone in my family has two girls. Literally, my grandmother had two girls, my mom and my Titi Fuji. Titi Fuji had two girls, Diane and Desiree. Nilda, my mom, had two girls, Adrian and Claudette. Desiree, my cousin, had two girls, Deborah and Deanna. My sister Claudette had two girls, Jet and Bo. Wow. So we, remember we were like, yeah. this is crazy. We're gonna do the same, we're gonna have two girls. We're like, we want two girls, we want two girls. So, now begins how ignorant we were to this whole process and we're gonna break it down for you guys. So we knew each other as friends for three years. Uh, matter of fact, I say this often, the first day I ever met her, I actually met her entire family the same day. We were all deep, you know, yeah. to church. And we've been connected and friends ever since. We dated for eight months mm -hmm. and got married. And we, we both agreed on this. Like, let's take a year and just live life, go to Europe, like travel and- Enjoy and be. being married. Yeah, I think yeah. there's something really beautiful about that first year of marriage, which some people say, oh, it will be the hardest. And for us, it wasn't that it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And we wanted to just rest in that yeah. and enjoy that and nest in that. And, you know, fully, fully be, be blessed, blessed in, in that. that. Mm -hmm. So we took that year, had a great year, first year of marriage. And High we, yes, I started kind of actively doing research on, okay, who is the best IVF doctor mm -hmm. in, in California and we ended up at Dr. Suri and he was amazing mm -hmm. and we had our first visit there. Actually, we went to Dr. Wong <gasps> first. Oh, you I forgot. forgot this piece. So we went to Dr. Wong first and we had made a very, very classic mistake and that was for my birthday that year, we had gone to the Dominican Republic. Actually, it was an amazing trip. It was awesome. We love DR. However, but... the last day the last day we were there i got stung by a mosquito i know i did bit like bit full on they don't sting they bite i think they bite whatever the mosquitoes do they did and the next day i had a fever i was i was every bone mm -hmm. ached i knew something is wrong here we flew back to new york and from new york to la and babe my hair hurt like everything hurt my, literally the his hairs on my skin, skin hurt was in pain and i was like mm, it's probably is... not good i don't think that's just a mosquito bite so we figured i probably was carrying zika for a little bit and i feel like no one talks about it anymore yeah. like i'm sure zika still exists but you know we hear it headlines was, of things wild for a it's while. popular and then we never hear about it again but i experienced it because i was very truly sick. miserable so when we went they said hey where have you guys traveled the last six months and we're like oh we just got back from dr and they're like Okay, so come see us in six months then because... If yes. you've been to a Zika area, they really wanted you to idea. wait six months so that just in case, which in our case, if we're being honest, we were like... Probably a good thing. You <laughs> definitely had it. And you know, that's a real concern for the effect that that will have on your future child. Right. It felt like there was always some sort of setback. What the heck, Every man? We went to Dr. Suri's office, made sure I didn't have any Zika. And, uh, Six and then, months later. Yeah, and then he started walking us through the process of IVF. I love the idea of maybe to some extent being a bit of a control freak and a manifestation freak where I was like, oh my gosh, I know exactly how I want it to be. I, we have these names picked out. <laughs> this is just the truth. I've put my career first for so many years that I think it was my natural default to consider my job even when I was family planning. Consider, well, 
I work from September until May and I get the summers off. So probably giving birth in the summer would be best, top of the summer, so that I can have the three months off with my baby and I'll go right back to work in September. I, I regret that. I regret that so much now because when I look back, I'm like, I don't care if it interrupted everything. everything. Yeah. What I would give now to have gotten pregnant and it be an easy journey, I wouldn't have cared at all if it had disrupted every and anything. Sure. So with that being said, thinking about these things meant that I had to get pregnant in August, give birth in May, I'd have off May, June, July, August, four months at home with my baby, and then come back to work in September. And these were the things that we were kind of being crazy about so to sit down in a doctor's office and go from like, okay, so this is the plan to him pretty much halting my whole world when he did the first exam and checked my follicles and was like, um, we've got a problem. You do not have the amount of eggs that you should have for someone at your age. What should that egg count look like? And he, he I will a never number forget. That was quadruple what he Yeah, had. he was like, the average woman comes in and gets stimulated and she will most likely have up to, and again, you guys, I'm not a doctor, so I am not telling you facts. Do not take any of these numbers. I'm just telling you what I remember from my own personal experience. It was a number close to 18, 18 to 20 yeah, yeah. eggs that a woman will get in her retrieval, which is after you've gone through the IVF cycle, they then retrieve eggs from you and he was like, the average person has like eight to 10 follicles. And we were looking at like possibly one. And in that moment, I was like, wait, what? That changed how we viewed this whole process. We realized in that moment, this was not gonna be as easy or as glamorous as we imagined it would be. It certainly went from being a vanity, like we're gonna do this, we're gonna manufacture this, we are going to create this because it works for our lives. Mm -hmm. It is a moving target, it's not gonna be as simple as you think it is. And you should prepare for a journey. Peak fertility for the average woman is at 24. I've gotta be honest, like I was shocked by that because 24 years old, and then I thought to myself, what was I doing at 24? Like I, put my career first, I you know, got my life together, I finally found the love of my life, someone I married, and that felt totally normal and healthy on a societal level at 33, 34. Sure. 30 is the new 20. Biology has not caught up to society. <laughs> and these are just the facts. When you get your period, technically that was the indication that my body was ready to Here. begin to have children. Are we in the Bible times? Like what? Like that just blew my mind personally. So he pretty much was telling me I was old people and I was not prepared for that information. So even after hearing that information, I'm not gonna lie, I was like, oh dang. Okay, I don't have a lot of eggs, but I was still so hopeful. Yeah. And to some extent, ignorance, is bliss and I still didn't really fully understand what that meant. And I was just like, all right, IVF, here we come. And Dr. Surrey had been very encouraging. He's like, hey, you know, I've, I've seen cases like this, be just fine, you're gonna be great. We sort of had to get over the idea of like, okay, we're gonna have twins. You know, it's like, let's, let's get what we can at that point. Yeah, right? I think that was his biggest thing and I was still like, okay, dude, whatever. I'm still having my twins. Like, I do not <laughs> regret this journey at yeah. all because the way that it has shifted my perspective that even in telling you this story, I'm like, why was I so stuck on like the sex of the baby? Definitely want girls. Girls, girls, like gonna have girls. Down Twin to girls, the month they should be born The month in. they should be born. It, it sounds so stupid to me now looking back, but that's what this is for. What is that saying? Man makes plans and God laughs. Oh, that's has it. he had a laugh. <laughs> he was at a, he's been at a comedy show watching us, okay? 
didn't even know what IVS was gonna entail and just the process of it. So I'm gonna kind of walk you guys through what my process looked like. And it started with, oh my gosh, the first thing I had to do was that test. There's a, a water Ooh. test that they do that can be quite painful. On top of that water test, they also say you can like faint. Yeah. I guess they're gonna put iodine inside there was like something Some sort of to, for or them is it to saline see. i remember they had they have to have somebody on standby with the salts with Just the in ammonia case, in case salts in case you smelling salts. smelling salts yeah. yeah in case you faint to wake you up they um ask you a few questions and you have this procedure done for me it was extremely uncomfortable and that was the first step. So again, I was like, mm, this is not as glamorous as I thought it was gonna be. I'll tell you what else was not as glamorous as we thought. And they said, you're gonna go talk to so-and-so in the financial office. And we were like, okay. We walk over there and she begins to say, these are the charges. This is what the practice charges. This is what the doctor charges. This is what the anesthesiologist charges. This is, you're gonna have to go to this other place to do this. And we we're like, the amount we're of looking at each other like, like hitting each other on the table like is this uh and then it was like oh and by the way it's gonna be about seven eight thousand dollars worth of shots and and yeah and because medicine. you also have to pay for the medication separately which was a lot of the cost mm -hmm. and again i'm sitting here and going oh this was supposed to be a glamorous experience <laughs> and when we're saying glamour we mean expensive yeah there was a part of me that recognized wow, I have such a desperation to become a mom and I can't imagine what that would feel like if this wasn't an option for me. Right. And I know that there's so many women out there that financially this is not an option for them. Just the initial, whoa, this is gonna be a full-time thing. And, um, but even then, like when I speak to her resilience, like even then it was like, all right, let's go. Let's do this. Let's we're ready. Let's go. Whatever the odds are, we're going to defy them and we're going to win. And and thus begin our first process. So, I am not necessarily somebody that's afraid of needles, which if you're going through the IVF process, make peace with make that. Make peace with that because I think people think it's just like Oh yeah, you gave yourself one needle during the day and it's just a small little prick and it's nothing. No. <laughs> we are talking, what was I, what did I do first? I had the clicker that, one. That was the fall stem. So I yeah. did something called fall stem in the morning and I would shoot that into my belly and we actually would, you look at your belly button and you actually count like two inches below and then two inches to the right or mm -hmm. two inches to the left and you kind of would alternate which side you were going to shoot yourself that day. So if in the morning I shot myself on the right, at night I'd shoot myself on the left. If I shot myself on the left at night, in the morning I would shoot this and we'd pretty much go back and forth and mix it up that way. So this is crazy because I was actually excited for these shots initially. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> Twist it, put it to the number, I mean, shoot we would up. put music on like a specific song. Yeah, we were very off. intentional. Like, yeah, and put the lights down a little bit. And it, I gotta be honest, it was great. It was bonding for it us. It was very bonding for us. And she, she really trusted me with that needle. He was the one that Three would do all my shots and we would like hold each other's hands and we'd pray. pray. We'd play specific songs. And again, like, just like, can you believe we've gone like crazy, right? My, my beard was black during that time, guys. <laughs> that, that should tell you what we've been through. <laughs> and when your desire is so deep to be a mother, you don't even think about that pain. I would get those shots done and I would be with my eyes closed. Zen. Just zen chill, yeah. and thinking about what does my baby's face look like? Praying for all five fingers all 10 fingers and all 10 toes and like I would imagine what my baby smells like and that moment that they would put the baby on me and I'd get to finally have that like these are the things I was thinking of so for me those shots were while sometimes really painful so worth it you're supposed to do these shots for about 14 days and some people stop earlier if they're 
eggs are growing and they've got great things going on, then the doctor will say, okay, you've stimulated enough eggs in your ovaries and we are ready to do what is called a retrieval of your eggs versus me, I had a very slow start and we didn't see a lot of stimulation initially that I would go all 14 days. And let's keep it real, around the 10th day, I'd be looking at you like, uh, so we have to do this again. Because there was one, that one would burn, right? There was no, no Menopure. Menopure, man. I had this shot in the evening, so it would be my Oof. morning shot, and then in the evening, I would have two shots. One was Omnitrope, mm -hmm. and then my second one was Menopure. For me, and it's so crazy because I ended up joining a bunch of like support groups and like online so your identity was hidden but at the same time like i'd hear stories from other women of like hey are, are you on this one are you on that one and there was certain things they would share they'd be like oh it burns and they'd be like we've heard that before and i wouldn't or feel like i was that crazy would make you feel like it was gasoline gasoline in, in yeah. my mouth and when i googled it there were other women that were like yes yes i taste the gasoline in my mouth imagine injecting something into your stomach and suddenly tasting like metallic yeah. An overwhelming, what you imagine, yes. gasoline taste. You would smell it. You would smell it when you took the syringe. And but I would started... taste it in my mouth. Yeah, as well. But for me, that second shot at night, literally as it was going in, it would feel like there was acid burned. being burned under my skin. So that was that was pretty tough. And we did that for 14, 14 days. days. every time. And we'd go in and the, also no one tells you that it's not just these shots. They also have to do blood work on you every other day while going through this IVF problem to check your hormone levels. She has an autoimmune disease. Yeah. So. Hashimoto's. Hash, hypothyroidism, right? Yeah. So what would happen is when the IVF shots would happen, her thyroid and and those levels would go out of control. Yeah. So every other day we're getting more blood drawn at your endocrinologist, yeah. right? Because I would swing yeah. between hypo, which is leans towards Graves disease, and hyper, which was leaning towards Hashimoto's side. Right. So right. it was the way that my endocrinologist, who's my uh, thyroid doctor, would explain it to me was your body is like a car mm -hmm. and you either have your foot on the gas or you've got your foot on the brakes. Right. We've got to find out how we can get you on cruise control. And that has really been one of the difficulties of my life since I was 15 and diagnosed was trying to figure that out. Now you bring in, you know, fertility journey and family planning and there have been so many women with this autoimmune disease, with thyroid issues, and it has taken a toll on their fertility. So one does kind of go in hand with the other, and so that got crazy. So I was being tested by my endocrinologist, blood work, by IVF. the IVF doctors, blood work, and then we had tons of shots going on in here as well. On top of genetic screening, we, didn't, we okay, so even before starting IVF, they had us do genetic screening to make sure that we weren't carriers of any um, genetic disorders or that sort of thing. In that genetic testing that also happened during this time, so we're getting blood taken from you, blood taken from me, testing on Israel, testing on me to make sure that we don't have any genetic disorders because we actually ended up finding that I am a carrier of sickle cell anemia. And if he was a carrier of sickle cell anemia, there would be a really high chance that our child could possibly come out with that. And they like to inform you of these yeah. things so that you can make a an informed, an informed decision. decision. To be totally honest with you, how many calls did we get from different companies that had done this genetic testing on us? And half of the time, I really didn't even know what they were talking about. There was something about my heart. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of little things that had never come up as an issue throughout my entire life. But now I was uncovering so many different layers of problems. Did you want to do layers? I did, yeah. So many layers. I, I honestly didn't even understand it all. I really didn't. I would hear and do these phone calls and kind of be like, okay, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> I just want my baby. So on day 14, 
Um, we went in and they're like, okay, it's time. Retrieve. You're gonna do your retrieval. They give you a retrieval date and they kind of walk you through the process of what a retrieval looks like. Again, in my ignorance, I thought that it was like, oh yeah, they retrieve your eggs. I didn't know if that was like, you pee them out. Guys, like I didn't know that I was gonna have to be put under. under. Which is the whole thing. Yeah, you. you get put into twilight um, with anesthesia and they put you to sleep and it's it's a surgery. They they It's an invasive surgery. And I tend to be quite uh, anxious when it sensitive, comes to, to yeah, sensitive when it comes to um, medication and just the idea of that. So imagine me going through all of this and also being somewhat of a hypochondriac and being like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't know how this is going to affect me. Is this going to make me feel weird? Is it going to give me anxiety? Uh, my estrogen levels being up, feeling moody. Am I not going to feel like myself? And there are so many women that go through that where they don't feel like themselves, they, you know, emotional and just I've had so many friends that have had completely different experiences with IVF. I would like to think that I was okay. Do you feel I was moody or crazy? Maybe a little bit. I mean, no. I, I mean, I, I'm being honest. There were, there were some days it's like, what is this? Because this doesn't seem like your natural way of dealing with things. Yeah. And and our doctor was like, oh, these will do a number on Hormones. your Hormones. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, again, I. I can't, I can't honor you enough as to how big of a champ you've been going through this. And even if there's a bad day, the next day is, we've never had two consecutive bad days. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And that's because you're amazing. I've been just trying to hold on people, hold on to my dreams, hold on to my life, hold on to my sanity. And so we get ready for our first egg retrieval. I was told that it looked like I had six to eight um, follicles. And I was so excited yeah. about that idea. I'm like, eight? I'm like, eight babies? Again, ignorant because that's not how it works. So I'm kind of going to walk you guys through my experience with my first retrieval. I specifically wanted to talk to my anesthesiologist before to explain that I was anxious and nervous about going under. We'll call him Bruce. And, Bruce. you know, it's Bruce. Bruce came in and crazy enough, the first time I had a retrieval, I was so anxious yeah. and so nervous that they had to put something in my IV to calm me down. To do this. Because to, to do the blue IV, to just calm everybody down. just calm down, calm down. Ten nine good night good night and we come out of the retrieval i wake up israel's right there by my side and i remember dr suri telling me we've got six eggs oh my gosh now again in my mind i'm like i'm having six babies i've got three well, sets of names. twins yeah, we need new names and yeah <laughs> so they actually give you a pack to go home with in case there's any spotting, which is totally normal. And you're gonna be a little crampy and they kind of just tell you to go home and chill. So that's what I did. I went home, I chilled, we ordered food. I, it was, I was so excited and I'm like, oh my gosh, we've got six eggs, we've got six babies. And they call you later that day and they tell you how many of those eggs fertilize. This is where things get interesting. I had six eggs. From the six eggs, only four of them fertilized. From the four of them being fertilized, you then wait to it's see if it's egg. going to hatch. Mm -hmm. So there's certain steps that these fertilized eggs have to go through to become actual embryos. And then we wait, I think it's like two weeks. You wait pretty much two weeks to not only see if they go on to become embryos, but then you are gonna genetically test those embryos and you have to make sure that they don't have any abnormalities, that they are healthy, good embryos. And so day 14 came around and I was actually, I'll never forget this, I was at a hair salon called Sex on Pico. I was getting my hair done, I was sitting under the dryer and I was just waiting for that call from Dr. Suri because I was waiting to find out. And, and it's so crazy how 
I had an event that night. Simple, yeah. I remember how simple it was where it was just like, I wonder what I got. Did I get girls? Did I get boys? Because here is the thing that so many people I think are clueless about is they're like, oh, you get to pick the sex of your baby. That is actually not true. I found out that you don't get to pick the sex of your baby. Your husband actually determines, the sperm determines the XY chromosome situation. And while you can have, you know, maybe three girls, three boys, you then decide which one you want to get pregnant mm -hmm. with. And that's how you can choose your sex. But if you had six embryos and all six of those are boys, that's, that's what, what you got. got. Yep. So I didn't understand that. I thought that scientifically they could make my embryo a girl or make my embryo a boy. Like, oh, I, doctor, I'm picking girl. It does not work that way. <laughs> if you don't get a girl, you don't get a girl. If you only got boys or you wanted a boy and you only got girls, that's what you got. So what did so, we get, mama? So I was actually really excited. I'm yeah. at, the, at the salon and I'm just like, Oh my gosh, I, I just know that, you know, I got two girls and maybe two boys or whatever. Because at this point, we're now down to four embryos. They've told us that four of them have made it and now they're going to genetic testing. And I'll never forget that call. And it was, hi, it's Dr. Suri. How you doing, kiddo? What do you say? Yeah, <laughs> how you doing, kiddo? And, and he would say, We've, we've got bad news. We've tested all four and all four are abnormal. And I remember being like, wait, well, what does that mean? They said you actually did get two girls and two boys and they've all tested abnormal. Meaning Downs or something, right? They, they were missing chromosomes. I did have one that did test for Down syndrome. Um, and then two of them were just, just not viable and viable. not good. And so I was like, okay, so what does that mean? And... He basically said, we got to try again. But I want you to understand something about her. I had an event that night that she was coming to. And I'm up there singing like ignorance is bliss, like I'm about to get good news, I can't wait. Probably tomorrow is when the doctor's gonna call. She did not tell me that the doctor had called that day. She did not tell me of the bad news she had gotten. She supported me on stage the whole time. I forgot about that. And then we got in the car to drive home. And I could just tell like the temperature in the car is different. Like something's, something's not right. And I said, hey, are you okay? And she, she was like, I, I didn't know how to tell you. I didn't know when to tell you. Yeah, it's so weird how women, we um, we internalize things. Because I felt like, like I didn't want to disappoint you and ruin your evening. And for some reason, I felt bad for it. Like I, like, I just, it's so bizarre. And I know you would never make me feel that way. But I was just like, and maybe, maybe selfishly, I also just didn't want to confront it in that moment. Selfishly, mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to say it out loud because if I said it out loud, then it's real. Yeah. And and I wasn't ready to do that until one, we'd be alone and I could really have that moment mm -hmm. with you. And so that was our first experience with IVF. Here's what I remember her saying. Well... We tried, I guess, I guess that's what it is. So that's it. And it was, it was very on the back burner through the holidays. Cause this was like October, mm -hmm. right? This absolutely was October. Yeah. And then the end of October, we went the through the holidays and right just after Thanksgiving, it, I just sort of said, I'm going to believe that we'll come back around to this. And we did, we did top of the year. We went and did top another Top of the one. year. I went and I did another cycle. And we go in for a retrieval, and this time I got eight eggs, six fertilized, and now we waited. It's crazy how my mindset changed from, well, I wonder what the sexes are, to please just let something work.
I hope I get something. I will never forget, we were at Elevation Church. Yep. Israel had just produced an album for Stephen Furtick and Elevation Worship called Evidence. Mm -hmm. And this was their Sunday morning for the Summer album release. Yeah, yeah. I was actually capturing moments for Israel for his Instagram. We've got to try to find that archive stuff. I'm literally filming for his IG story. Tasha Cobbs is singing Here is in Heaven with Israel on the stage. And, you know, I was just getting the footage. And at some point, she sings the line, A, a miracle, miracle can, can happen, happen now. now, but the Spirit of the Lord is here. And she's literally singing, A miracle can happen now. And in the middle of my filming, I get a phone call. From a Beverly Hills number. And I was like, you just ruined my IG story. <laughs> and I, I ignore it. And I go back to filming and all of a sudden pops up like the you've got a voicemail, but you can read the transcript of a voicemail uh, on your phone. <laughs> so after I finished and you know, the worship was over, I sat down on my phone and I went to go look and it says, Hey, it's Dr. Suri. I've got good news. Wow. And <laughs> I, I can't look at you. I started crying. Cause I knew it was good news and I was so excited that like Israel was gonna get off of um, the, stage. the stage and and I and you came and you sat down next to me and I'm like sitting there. I'll never forget it was John Gray sitting in front yeah, of us yeah. and and I and no one knows that we're going through any of these things. Right. No one knows what we've been like it's like he's the only one that I can share it with and I'm just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's good news. We got something. There's good news and I am thrilled. So it's a Sunday. Obviously, I have to be back at work on Monday morning for the real. So we're flying back um, out of North Carolina. And I tell Israel, let's wait till it's just the two of us. Um, and we're sitting down. Let's get to the airport early so that we can have like a moment to call the doctor back. And so we do. We're sitting there. We, we ordered our glasses of wine to like cheers. We knew it was good news. We wanted a toast. And I sit there at the, at, at the table with you and I call and I'm like hi and he's like it's good news kiddo <laughs> he's like you've got two healthy embryos and I just started bawling my eyes out um and he's like do you want to know the sex and, of I, and the truth is I was like yes I want to know and he says you've got a healthy baby girl embryo and I am oh <laughs> so excited in that moment. And then he goes, and you've got a baby boy. And she was like, what? Because she just knew. I knew for sure it's two girls. It's two, two girls. girls. Yeah, yeah. Everyone in my family has two girls. And in that moment, I remember being like, wait, what? And it was not disappointment. Yeah. It was not an ounce of disappointment. In that moment, I remember exactly what I, I said. I have a son? Because I just never imagined, I, and it sounds so stupid and so silly and so foolish, but I was like, I have a son? And then we called my mom, was yeah, the first call we made, and course. you. I could not hold it together. Him telling my mom, and even my mom was like, What's like, wrong? because this is the reality. I was like, God gave, God gave us a boy? Like, that's so cool. Like. But I, this is just my reaction in the moment. And we were like, oh my God, so cool. And I actually filmed this little video here of us getting onto our plane. And I'm like, we got the best news ever today. I am the names that we had at the time. I am blank and blank's mom. Mm -hmm. And it was a girl name and a boy name. And we got on that airplane just so full we floated, of hope. We floated back to California. Yeah. And when we got there, they're like, you're in the zone. Let's go again. Yeah. They're like, you're never going. And this was the medical advice I got at the time was, you want to try because you are at a deficit of eggs. Mm -hmm. At this point, you want to try to harvest as many as you try to bank as many as you can in this moment, because literally every 30 days you are at a, you are at a de you're decreasing. 
in eggs. You're losing eggs. You're losing eggs every month. So they're like, let's try to do another one. Mm -hmm. Let's try to get as many as we can so that we have a higher chance of getting pregnant. And so I did. I went right into doing another cycle. And that cycle ended up being what is considered a failed cycle. So a failed cycle means that I shot myself with the exact same uh, drugs I did the first time. And now this time, when they were going and checking on me, my blood work levels, my ultrasounds, when they would go in and see if anything was growing in there. Yeah. Yeah. Normally the follicles are growing at kind of a really measurable rate. Yeah. Each week, you know, you could see the difference. They were like, these aren't growing. We're not quite sure why, but like it's just not, the process isn't going the way we would expect. And, he, and he's like, our advice is just, just stop on this one. And that was tough. Yeah. I don't know why that one was so Because tough. we were just, had just come off of this high. Of a win, yeah. Of like, we've got a girl, we've got a boy, let's go see what else we're gonna get, you know? And then it was like, and you have a canceled cycle, meaning you've done all your shots for the last 12 days and nothing has grown. So there isn't even anything for us to go and retrieve. Mm. So you don't get a retrieval because there's nothing to retrieve. I remember just being really disappointed Yet, in denial, I was coming up with all these conspiracy theories of, you know, they want my money, uh, maybe because they know I have money, uh, they canceled my cycle. If you have gone through this... Man, it's a roller coaster. You understand probably what I'm talking about. If you've ever had to have an argument with yourself and in your own mind to tell yourself, there's... There's nothing wrong. They're trying to, you know, tell me I have to do this again because it'll cost even more money. And so in my own conspiracy theories, I was like, I need a second opinion. So I went and I saw Andy Wong. Third cycle was Should've now, fourth, fourth so one is now with Dr. Andy Wong. Wong. And so now this is just a different doctor, possibly a different way of doing things different medications, getting the same diagnosis that, yes. You make you've, quality eggs, but you don't make a quantity of eggs. And we've got to try to get as many as we can right now. So I go through the summer, I actually shot Mass Singer, but this is before we even started the show. Mm -hmm. We go through another IVF cycle, again, 14 days. Now I meet Grace. Grace was the anesthesiologist who I you know, Love her. loved her and she was just so kind to me. And we go and we do the retrieval. At this point, they're seeing like a possibility of four eggs before my retrieval. So I'm going in hopeful, but this is definitely the lowest number I've ever gotten. So they're like, okay, you've got four this time. They go in and I think they got like two. That's correct. And two went through the process. We believed two made it really close. And at the end, only one was healthy. The day we found out that I got another healthy embryo was my first day on set Mass at Mass Singer. Singer. And it was my first day ever going into the trailer. And I remember getting the information and calling you. I mean, I think one in one. You tell me. Okay, I'll tell you this much. We got one more baby. So wow. it was not a fail. We got something out of it. There's a little baby that is in a fridge right now, perfectly healthy, another addition to our family. Oh my God. Oh my God. What do you think it is? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Statistically, I think it's a boy, but I pray it's a girl. We ended up finding out that we got our second girl. And you just cried on the phone because you were like, we got another one? We got another one? <laughs> we got a little girl. 
And I filled the whole living room with pink balloons. I went and actually got custom baby spoons made, silver spoons made with our baby's names engraved in them. I went and got a baby book that was named after um, the baby boy's name. Mm -hmm. Oh no, it was actually our baby girl's name. Mm -hmm. And so at the time I I got the book, the house was filled, and then I surprised you. And we actually have the footage of you walking into the house with all the balloons and just crying, it's a girl. And do we have footage of you in lingerie as well? Or is that- Was I in lingerie? Feel like I think I, I was in lingerie. lingerie. Yeah, it was fantastic. Lingerie, silver spoons, <laughs> balloons. We're having a baby. Listen, we would like to say that while other people just got to make love and make children, I was shooting myself, but still making, making love. love. Like we 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 Don't were like we're twisted. still gonna make love <laughs> to create these babies and the idea. These children are so intentional and so wanted. And it's so such a loved. gift from God. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you so much for tuning into our fertility journey and just our journey of faith and familia. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm.